Hey guys, what's up? I am Jess, and this is Roots and Refuge Farm. This is my garden. Right now, we're about to head into the greenhouse. I am uh, repotting a lot of seedlings, and I wanna talk to you guys about something that I get asked about all the time. It's a lot of pots ready to be filled, a lot of little seedlings that need to be separated. I started my YouTube channel a few years ago. I uh, started really regularly posting two years ago, about this time of the year. And I did not consider myself an expert gardener. I still don't consider myself an expert gardener. I'm very much a student in gardening. However, it is something that we've really embraced and decided to invest a lot of our resources in. And it's something that I really, really love. It's kind of funny when you start a YouTube channel, sometimes you kind of just set out to share and you don't really know what your little pocket um, is gonna be. You don't know who your audience is going to be. And sometimes sometimes you have a general idea and sometimes it surprises you. And I actually, if you had asked me when I started YouTube, I definitely would have thought that we would have appealed more to like chicken keepers or goat keepers. Um, the fact that we ended up with really a gardening channel actually was a surprise to me because I felt like I was so new at it and I was just learning so much. Uh, but what I found was there were a lot of people in the world who had a desire to grow, who felt passionate about gardening, um, and they felt a little overwhelmed uh, at, at the prospect of getting started. And so here they saw a person who was passionate and excited about it uh, that wasn't necessarily an expert, but that was having success simply because she tried. And that is that is my story and kind of how I got into this. And of course now we have a lot more success because we have more experience. It is a passion of mine now that I did not know that I would have to um, teach people to get started in the garden. And so with that being the case, there's one question uh, that comes up a lot. What should I grow for my first garden? Um, if I'm not gonna have a lot of space. Now, I absolutely encourage you, um, if you are getting into gardening, not to get in over your head, um, as tempting as it may be to go till an acre in here on your property or do something like crazy. Um, it, it, is, it is best to learn on a smaller scale. Uh, it just sets you up a little bit better for success to not um, get overwhelmed really. And it's easy to get overwhelmed in the garden, especially during like peak harvest times, uh, the maintenance of getting it all taken care of. And it, it's very discouraging to grow a big garden that just goes to weeds or to be so overwhelmed with food, even if you do have success that you don't know what to do with it. So I do suggest really kind of easing into things. And so what happens is a lot of times people will have their first garden and they've got a couple of four foot uh, raised garden beds or something like that. And then they think, wait a second, I, I can't grow very much in this. What in the world do I grow? And that's really the question I wanna talk about today. What do you grow? Uh, in your early gardening attempts if you don't have very much space. I'm gonna move over here where it's not quite as bright in my eyes. This question, just like anything with gardening, when you're getting into gardening, uh, you may be tempted to go search out black and white answers for gray questions. Um, because when you're learning something new, uh, what we what we tend to want, what makes us t really feel safe, is like really firm boundaries, yes and no rules to follow. Uh, that's just what makes us feel safe. And gardening is not really that kind of thing. It, it really is a journey. You're going to keep learning over the course of time. You're going to develop preferences, um, and and that's good. You want those things. And so, really, one of the things that I really think is very important as a as a person who is teaching and encouraging and gardening is that I don't want to tell you exactly what to think. I would really rather encourage you uh, with some tools of how to think. Because the thing is, is that uh, you're going to be able to get gardening advice from people who grow all over the place um, in lots of different circumstances, lots of different climates and uh, soils and 
all kinds of life walks and things change based on circumstances and so that said I can't give you like a black and white here's exactly what you should grow in your first garden these varieties do it on this day do it in this exact way um, if I tried to present that to you I think I would be doing you a disservice so I instead I want to give you some thinking points as far as the decision that you have to make about what you're going to grow in your first garden in your limited space. My first garden that actually grew much, I tried. I really did try for a while. I did some containers. Um, I did a, a garden in the ground, which was an utter failure um, years and years ago. We had miserable amounts of rain and clay soil and it just completely drowned. Um, and then we moved out here and my very first summer here, I had two four by four foot raised beds. And that was probably my first actual successful garden. And I grew a lot of food in those four by four foot square beds. Um, and I learned a couple of things. So when you start out in your first garden, no matter what you choose to grow, uh, making sure that you're using really good healthy soil is going to really impact the yield that you get. Basically, if you're growing in a small space, you can feed your soil well uh, so that it can support your plants and you'll get a higher yield from whatever it is that you choose to plant. And so that's really important to know whenever you're getting started. Um, you definitely need to make sure that you have good soil. Um, and you can test it if you're, I mean, if you're starting with like bagged soil, you know, it's gonna be pretty, uh, pretty level. But if you've got existing soil, just testing it and amending that with organic matter like compost. I use compost, it's what I amend my soil with. And uh, that's gonna set you out for success. Another thing to keep in mind, absolutely is what your family eats um i've said this before i mean don't don't fill an entire bed up with lettuce if no one in your house eats salads um if you have zero people in your house who will eat a tomato don't grow three different kinds of tomatoes now i do think that it's really good to try homegrown um, plants to know if you like them because truly I've had plenty of people who tell me that they don't like tomatoes come in my garden and pick cherry tomatoes off a plant and eat them and go oh wow I actually really do like this um, homegrown food does taste very different than what you can purchase in the store and so I, I think there is something to be said about giving things a try to know if you like them um, but if you have tried them and you know that nobody's gonna eat it don't dedicate a ton of space to it so no Knowing what your family eats, um, how your family eats, if you're trying to make life changes, if you're in a place where you know your family has not been eating a lot of healthful food and so you're wanting to start growing food to make that change, you might not know what you guys like. Uh, you might not know what's going to go over well in your family, in which case I would say grow enough in this first garden in the limited space to really give things a try to know if you need to create more space for those things in the future. There are a lot of things like radishes that a lot of people have never, um, they've never really experienced. Uh, outside of maybe grabbing a few fresh radishes off of a salad bar somewhere, but they've never eaten them roasted or like cooked into soups and stuff like that. And so they don't know that that's a really viable option uh, to add to their family's regular diet. And so I think that giving a little bit of space to try a homegrown version of something is a really smart thing to do. Grow a cherry tomato plant. Grow a small area of radishes. Uh, try these new things. So you can grow eggplants. Maybe you've never cooked eggplants before. I, just don't go crazy on those things. Um, maybe if you've never tried something before but you want to give it a shot, just grow one of them. We're gonna come sit out here in the pavilion where it's not super hot <laughs> and finish talking about this and then I will go change and finish my job in the greenhouse. So uh, another big thing to consider beyond what you know your family likes and what you may like to try a homegrown uh, version of for your family. Uh, another big thing to consider is uh, the, f the fruits ver versus vegetables. And I think this is something that a lot of people don't really grasp starting out in gardening. So a fruit um, botanically what that actually is is the structure of a plant that holds the seeds kind of like the ovary of the plant and and so for instance like a tomato plant tomatoes are fruits so a lot of things are fruits like, I mean technically like a cucumber is a fruit and a, um, a pepper is a fruit uh, 
because the seeds exist inside of that structure. The term vegetable in botany doesn't really doesn't really mean anything. With a vegetable, you're eating part of the plant, just like how with a, a fruiting plant we eat the fruit, but with a vegetable, you're eating like the root in the instance of a radish or a carrot or a beet. Um, with celery, you're eating the stem. With kale and lettuces, you're eating the leaves. Uh, on things like broccoli, the head of broccoli is actually all the buds which haven't opened up into flowers yet. And so you're actually just eating part of the plant and in the case of many vegetables, you actually end the life of that plant in order to consume that part. Like when you pull a carrot up and you eat the taproot, which is the carrot, you actually have the whole top part of the plant, which we just cut off usually and throw out. I mean, there are uses for that, but in like when you go to the grocery store, usually the top part is not even attached to the carrot that you purchase. And so that plant never goes to seed. It never puts off flowers. And so in the instance of like carrots in the same two square foot place, whereas a tomato plant plant uh, will continue to produce for the most part. Um, those are going to continue to produce. The carrots, once you pull all those up, you're going to have you know, a, a bunch of carrots about this big and that's it. That's what you're going to get. And so when people say I have a very limited amount of space um, to grow things, aside from growing things as a trial, like saying, okay, I'm gonna grow this two square feet of carrots because I wanna see how amazing homegrown carrots are. I wanna, I wanna experience these so I can decide if later I wanna create more space for those. Um, I don't really like to give small space gardens a whole lot of uh, space to those kinds of things, it, unless it's a trial to make a decision if I want more later. Because, I mean, I can go to, a local grocery store and purchase a five pound bag of organic carrots for like five or six dollars. And so that's about what's gonna come out of that two square foot space, if that. We might not even get that much out of that two square foot space. Whereas I can put that cherry tomato plant in that same space and five dollars of cherry tomatoes at the store, um, I'm gonna get that times many times off of that one plant as long as the soil is well fed. And that's something that I really think people need to take into consideration consideration when you're planning a small space garden. Now, uh, the exception to that is there are things, for instance, like kale, which you can cut some leaves off of kale and it will continue to grow. And so you can get continual harvests off of that vegetable. But as far as things like uh, heading vegetables, like broccolis and cabbages and cauliflowers, I mean, that, that plant's gonna take up a couple of square feet in your garden and you're gonna get one head of cauliflower off of it. Uh, you're gonna get one head of cabbage. And I will grow some of those things and what I typically will do with them, instead of just cutting it up and eating one meal of dinner, I'll do something like I'll ferment it to make sauerkraut because I wanna, I wanna make it last longer. I mean, it took up that much space in my garden. I wanna use that well and make sure it gets used entirely. But if I only had uh, two four by four foot beds, I don't know that I would want to use a whole lot of that space at all to be growing those things that just would not provide uh, that much volume of food for my table. Really do encourage people if they have really limited space to grow what they like, but also to really consider, um, especially growing through like the summer when you are gonna be growing those fruiting plants, to grow things that are going to actually offset more grocery budget because I know that whenever I really first started out in gardening, I had limited space. I would do things like I'd plant like a whole bed with green beans and then I would go harvest time and I would have like two handfuls of green beans and then I'd have to actually go to the store to buy more green beans to have enough to cook a meal for my family. And that was frustrating to me because I was like, this isn't really doing anything for me other than I liked the garden, the green beans that I got tasted really good, but I was thinking, what am I gaining from this? Because I'm putting an investment in. So, so I do think that keeping in mind kind of the value and the volume of what you're getting um, and, and trying to make decisions to grow things that really are gonna offset your grocery budget, um, that's, probably a good thing to keep in mind if you're starting out in a small space. Another factor to just kind of think about whenever you're planning this early garden, um, I would really talk to people who are local to you and find out just what grows great in your region. And that's not something that I can easily tell you in this video because so many of you are growing in really different places from me. All of those things are just points for you to consider, uh, kind of things for you to know 
to come to the conclusion that you need to come to as far as planting your first garden. But I do wanna give you an example of what I would personally do taking all of those things into consideration for myself. We're gonna go over to my kid's garden and I'm gonna tell you if that was my first garden, a smaller garden space, what I would be doing to make the most of that space. Uh, we built this for them because we wanted to encourage gardening in them and we wanted them to have a space that they could take responsibility for. So they've had this for a couple years now. We've done nothing for it this spring so it's completely uh, kind of blank and ready to go aside from a few weeds that are coming up and actually we have two beds that are three by eight feet and then this bed back here which is actually like a reclaimed part of a bunk bed uh, that is like four by five and I'm actually just going to talk about these two beds right here because we're talking about limited space and so I'm going to say okay what would we do with just these two beds because I consider this to be like a really great first garden size. So you can see here these two beds that are next to each other about three feet wide eight feet long that's an estimation and then we've got the arch cattle panel trellis going in between them right here the first thing that i would do in any limited garden space is figure out a way to grow up i'm a big believer in vertical gardening i even do that in my really big raised bed garden uh, we use a lot of cattle panels as trellises we do the arches uh, we do like long walls of trellises because growing up being able to really support your plants upwards it just maximizes space it's a lot easier on your back it makes for healthier plants because you got a lot of airflow you don't have to worry about uh, fungus quite as much and you don't have your harvest laying on the ground and so in a in a small space anytime I talk to somebody that's dealing with a few small raised beds I'm like figure out a way to get some trellises up we we've put this arch trellis up and basically what I would do if I were gardening in this um, and this was the only garden I had I would put two cucumber plants on one side of this trellis. Uh, cucumbers are very prolific. I would probably stick with a um, like a canning variety, like Boston pickling, Chicago pickling, National pickling, one of those varieties. So you could actually, since you're gonna put two plants on this side of the cattle panel, you could do two different varieties. That would be fine. There would be no reason not to. They might cross pollinate. So if you were wanting to save seeds, uh, you could end up with like an accident hybrid on that uh, but it would still be a cucumber you just have no idea what it would be like um, but yeah you could do like a, a, a pickling in a slicer if you wanted to have variety the reason I would personally do um, pickling cucumbers because they tend to be very prolific and they're pretty multi-purpose like you can juice them you can eat them in a salad but whereas pickling cucumbers you can use for fresh eating uh, slicer cucumbers have a lot of water content so they actually don't hold up very well to making pickles so I feel like the pickling cucumbers are maybe just a little more versatile so I would do two pickling cucumbers right here um, and on the other side of this trellis where it comes down, I would do two plants of like a small uh, personal sized melon, probably something like a Kajari melon, uh, maybe some sort of cantaloupe, just something small that could be supported with some pantyhose or net bags on here. M small melons like that are just really nice summer snacks. Um, we grow a lot of them because our kids can snack on them, but that's something that you don't have to worry about preserving. Uh, it's pretty easy to use up all of them fresh and doing a couple of, of little melons on the trellis would be a great way to make some food in your backyard. With vertical growing, um, you have to give give plants a little bit of a footprint there so that they can get all the water that they need but that actually frees up the other half of this bed because those things are going to grow up over my walkway and be out of the way the only thing i have to make sure is that they have enough soil space to get the water that they need but i can actually grow things right here on the side and it and i still have all of this space on the end and those cucumbers and melons are going to grow me a lot of volume as far as food out of this little space on the other half of my bed where these vertical trellises are to maximize this space i would put a few pepper plants on each one of here probably one two three that's about four feet wide right there and if i put three hot peppers on one side and three sweet peppers over on the other side i'm looking at the potential of growing quite a lot of food you you could probably actually go ahead and fit 
four pepper plants in that space because peppers really like to be uh, close. So I think I could probably comfortably maybe even squeeze in eight pepper plants along with my cucumbers and my melons right here on those halves of these beds. And now with that, um, those are going to produce, uh, they're gonna start setting flowers mid-summer and they're gonna produce all the way up until the frost. I'm gonna get a lot of food off of that. Uh, with the hot peppers, I could make salsa. Um, if I had an excess of those, I could dry them, grind them up into a powder. Uh, you could ferment those to make hot sauce. Uh, you just just have a lot of options for using those. It's not just a matter of picking a few and cutting them up into a dish. You actually have a lot of ways to use those. And the same thing with the sweet peppers. Um, you could grill those, roast them, eat them in salads, stuff them. Uh, you can cut those up and freeze them to use later in dishes. So it's not something that I have to worry about becoming overwhelmed by with just like four plants per side. I'm gonna actually be able to produce enough of those to to do something with. You, one of the things when you're dealing with a small space garden is you don't want to accidentally close yourself into that corner where you have too much of something to eat fresh, but you have not enough to actually do much pre preservation. You want to have ways to use it. And I think that doing peppers would be a really great way to use that space. Now that leaves me with the other ends of these garden beds. And what I would do with these is very simple. Um, in this one end, I would definitely put a couple of cherry tomato plants. Now, if I had very much space at all, and actually in this garden of my kids' garden, that bed down on the end that we're not talking about because I'm trying to limit myself here, uh, that's their tomato bed and they usually grow uh, three or four tomato plants down there in their garden. I personally, if I were only gonna go grow two tomato plants, um, I would probably do cherry tomato plants because you do get a lot of volume off of those. They're really versatile for fresh eating. You can cut them up, uh, put them in salads. You can dehydrate them. If you do get overwhelmed by them, you can freeze them and make sauces out of them. I just feel like with only two tomato plants, if you're not getting into making um, a lot of sauce and salsa, and all of that cherry tomatoes are just kind of where it's at for fresh eating and then on the other side here i've got about maybe eight square feet on the other side as well and i would absolutely put um probably three okra plants in that space in that um eight in that eight square feet, I'd just space them out just like that, give them enough space to really spread out, uh, get the nutrition that they need. Okra plants, they really thrive on neglect. They do really well uh, just about anywhere that you put them. They need heat. I'm in a hot place, so that's why these would be one of my choices. But okra is something that it really is amazing um, homegrown. It's really different than what you get at the store. And it, like we've discussed recently, we were making something and Jeremiah said, oh, okra would be really good with that. I was like, yeah, but we're not buying it at the store because store okra is just completely different. And so that's something that if I had a limited space, I would really, really want homegrown okra also it's a very productive thing. Once it gets going, um, it's gonna produce and produce and produce. And in a small space, you can actually get enough of it to consistently eat that as a side to your meal, even if you have a good size family. Now, one little trick here that I would definitely do with everything that I just said to you, um, the cucumbers, the melons, the peppers, tomatoes, and okra. Those would be my go-to in this space with these two small beds. But what I would absolutely do, let's say I was gonna go ahead and I was gonna plant my cucumbers and my, my peppers, and then over here I'm gonna have two tomato plants. Now, when I first put all of those things in, they're gonna be really small. If I put them from seeds in, they're just gonna be hardly anything at all. And over here, if I had my melons and peppers and then my three little ochre plants, you're gonna see a lot of soil which is where I would come in at that point with radishes. Um, radishes, I very rarely give radishes a lot of dedicated bed space. Instead, what I like to do is whenever I, I first plant plants that you have to give, you know, a good amount of space and you, you plant your garden and you look at it and you're like, 
Hmm, this looks puny and sad, and I feel like I should put more plants in here. Don't do it. I know that feels that way. I know that when you have a little space, you're thinking, surely I can grow more stuff in here. Let me just pile it all in, and you'll end up with, with little plants that don't produce a lot. Just give them the space that they need. However, in the meantime, to utilize the space that you have, you can plant radishes all throughout there, because radishes are ready to pick in like 23 to 28 days, depending on what time it is right now in the spring, uh, you know, past your last frost date when you start planting things like your okra and your tomatoes and your peppers some of those things take a little while to really explode um, and and when you start and your okra is just little bitty or even if you're directly sowing it starting from seed all that soil around there is just not getting used so planting radishes all throughout there will give you a harvest of something in a month and about the time you're pulling all of those things out and enjoying those in your kitchen your okra is going to at that point start to to stretch out your peppers are going to be getting big enough that they would become a hindrance to the radishes so it just works out um, there are other things that you could do that with. Um, beets are not as quickly growing as, as radishes, but you might could work a little line of beets in there. Um, and baby greens is another thing. Like a lot of times what I'll do in a raised bed, if I'm planting like rows of something, that middle space, I can't really plant something big in the middle space, but in the early stages of whatever's on the side, pepper plants or tomato plants, that middle space is a great place to stick onions. Um, you could you could line garlic down a middle space um, because even when it grows up it's not going to be really leafing it's not going to be really branching or anything like that and baby greens baby greens really struggle whenever it's getting hot outside and so if I just make a little indention down the middle of some other small immature plants or in the extra space around immature plants or freshly sown seeds and I just do a little indention and sprinkle some lettuce mixes like mescaline mixes down those then I'll get a couple of harvests of those leaves before my other plants start getting big and then I just tear them out I already ate from them a few times and uh, and I, then I, I go ahead and pull them out they're done they would be going to seed soon anyway and that's kind of how I make the most of all my space by fitting in little things in that window of time between planting something and then it really getting to where it, it needs all the space that you originally gave it a lot of people when they are first getting into gardening you know they'll start researching what they need to feed their family. You start doing things like Googling, you know, how many tomato plants do I need to feed a family of six or whatever. And then whenever you see something along the lines of like 25 plants per person, you may think, well, what's even the point of growing a garden if I can't grow one that big? If all you have space for is a couple of, of beds like this, just right off of your back porch, this, this, we used all reclaimed materials on this. This is, um, vinyl siding and first trimmings of cedar is what we made these beds out of they're not sunk into the ground they're just sat right on top of the the ground and filled up because we didn't know how long we wanted to leave this here we didn't know how interested the kids were going to be but this was a really cheap endeavor um and most people who even if you live in a neighborhood even if you're in a rental a lot of times something like this is not hard to do and it is worth it it is absolutely worth it if you have an interest in growing your own food to grow the small garden before you can grow the big garden. You're not gonna be doing a lot of preserving out of a little garden like this, especially if you're feeding more than one or two people. Uh, you're probably gonna eat everything that comes out of here fresh, and you might even have to add it with other things but it really is worth it because you can learn so, so much by this little bit of hands-on experience. Just having the experience of knowing how things grow, uh, what kind of soil needs, what kind of light needs, um, just understanding how things are gonna grow up a trellis, understanding how quickly things come to fruition. These are massive lessons that are so much easier to learn hands-on. And so if you're in a place that you're really wanting to garden, uh, please don't let the ideal discourage you from reality. Um, don't let what you would really like to do keep you from doing what you can right now because this is valuable. Small scale gardening is valuable. It's absolutely no secret that I love a big garden. Um, I love to expand and I do think that most people who get started eventually will get their, their hands dirty and think, oh, I love this and they'll, they'll grow bigger. We're currently doubling our gardening space. So obviously I'm a believer in doing things big but I do want to encourage you definitely to
So do what you can where you are. Turn your waiting room into a classroom and know that even, uh, even small efforts are massively uh, important and valuable in the grand scheme of things. I hope this helps you and uh, I am so looking forward to sharing this gardening year with you guys. I bless you until next time.